So my name is Michael Ashley, I'm from the University of New South Wales, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about terahertz observations of star-forming regions from the high plateau of Antarctica. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about terahertz and what it means and how, we're going, how we can use it to understand how stars form. My collaborators are, are shown there, Michael Burton, John Storey. And I put Craig Kalesa in a large font because he's a very critical person here who actually built the telescope and is, our, is a, you know, the, the main driver of this program. Okay, so let's start thinking about stars and the, the closest stars star to us obviously is the Sun. But it's very easy to just take it for granted. It's up there all the time and you probably don't give it much thought. But in fact, it's, uh, if you're a scientist, you can start thinking about the sun and asking some pretty simple questions. For example, there must have been some time before the, the sun uh, existed. So what happened before the sun existed and how was it formed? So this is a very fundamental question and it's not obvious how you might answer that. Just think about that for a moment. How would you work out how the sun formed and how do you think it happened? It's not easy. So what astronomers do is that they, to answer questions like this, they just get their telescopes out and start looking to see what's out there. And if you just observe the sky with your naked eye, you'll see something a little bit like this. So you can see the Milky Way and a whole bunch of bright stars. But there's nothing obvious there to indicate how stars may form. So you get a powerful telescope and have a closer look and what I've done here is I've zoomed in on this region here, towards the galactic centre, and this picture here shows something like a billion stars towards the galactic centre. But once again, there's not really much of a clue about how these stars got there. Now, it's easy to find examples of stars that are at the end of their lives, because you astronomers see lots of things like this. What looks like a star in the centre here, surrounded by an envelope, and you can measure the expansion of this envelope, and it's clearly an explosion of some sort. So this looks like something that's gone bang, and our sun is going to do this in about five billion years. So you don't have to worry about it for quite a while, but that's how we're going to end up. And there are lots of examples of these, and they, they can be quite beautiful. Here's another one called the Red Spider Nebula. And here's another one, very dramatic. This one's 3,000 light years away, and the speed of light, it will take you three, light years to, three years to cross it. And this one is a supernova remnant. This uh, exploded in the year 1006 and was seen uh, by humans and was likely to be the brightest supernova in recorded human history. So lots of exploding stars but no real clue about how all those little tiny dots were formed. And here's sort of postage stamps of a whole bunch of exploding stars and you don't really know which one the sun's going to turn into but it's going to be one of those. Okay, so a bit of a clue to how stars could form comes from these things. These are clusters of stars. You see all these bright blue objects here. These are stars which all formed about 150 million years ago in the same location in space. And so it looks like something's going on. Something happened 150 million years ago that caused these stars to form. And the question is, what is it? There's nothing, there's no real remnant of, of what it was. And, but this is the next clue. Astronomers see these things, dark, clouds, mysterious dark clouds, and through studying these we know that these are dark molecular clouds from which stars form. So if you come back and take a picture of this in maybe 10 million years or so, it will look like the previous slide, a whole bunch of bright blue sky, blue stars. But the real problem with understanding star formation is these things are black. You can't see inside them, so you get your optical telescopes onto them and you can't see what's happening, and radio doesn't tell you a great deal either. So this is where terahertz comes in. Here's some more examples of these objects. This is called the Snake Nebula, for obvious reasons. It looks a bit like a snake. And this is my favourite one, the Aquila Rift. This thing is seven light years across. It's uh, an amazing collection of dark objects. All these other stars here are just foreground objects. These fainter ones here are background objects. And what I'm referring to is this dark stuff here. And there are lots and lots of stars being formed. And just for reference, I did a quick calculation. And there are each pixel of this image here would contain 1.8 million million Earths. So that kind of gives you an idea of how insignificant uh, we are. Now, little problems uh, aren't really all that significant from an astronomical perspective. But from an astron astronomical perspective, from a, an astronomer's want to understand star formation, it's all happening in, ooh, sorry, inside this cloud, but you can't see it. So this is where terahertz comes in. You might be familiar with those instruments that you see at uh, airports where they scan you to see whether you've got a gun. 
that's using terahertz radiation. And so the same terahertz can actually see inside molecular clouds. So what is terahertz? Well, this is the electromagnetic spectrum, and I'm showing wavelength along the top and frequency, which is inverse wavelength there. And these, this is visible light is in this particular region. X-rays and so on are out here, infrared and radio. And the terahertz is this particular region between the infrared and the radio. You haven't heard about it very much because it's a very difficult place to do any science. There are three main problems with terahertz astronomy. Technically, it's very difficult to build the detectors. It lies halfway between radio, which is done with electronics, and optics, which is what you use for visible radiation. So, for example, computers and mobile phones, they work up to three to five gigahertz. But electronics beyond that frequency is very tough. Now, to get to terahertz, you're talking about a thousand gigahertz. So you're talking about something which is, you know, a hundred times faster than your mobile phone, and we can't yet do that very easily. So that's one problem. The second problem is very unfortunate. Terahertz radiation goes through light years of dark molecular clouds, no problem, but gets stopped by the amount of water vapour in this room. So if I had terahertz eyes, I couldn't see the back of this lecture theatre. And that's just due to the water vapour, which unfortunately just happens to like vibrating and rotating at the same frequency as the terahertz radiation. So that's a real problem. And the consequence of these two first problems is that there aren't many terahertz astronomers, so you can't, it's very hard to get funding because no one really knows anything about it. So it's a chicken and egg situation. So if you want to do terahertz astronomy, normally what you do is go into space. So you build something like this spacecraft, or you fly a 747 at high altitude, or you use a long duration balloon. These are all very expensive and have limited uh, observing time. So it's not ideal. If you try to do it from the ground, the best current uh, established sites are Mauna Kea Observatory in Hawaii and the Atacama Plateau in Chile. The real key to observing is trying to keep the precipitable water vapour low. That's, if you collapsed all the weight of water vapour in the atmosphere, how many millimetres would you have? And at Mauna Kea, that's one and a half millimetres. In Chile, it's 0 0.6. But unfortunately, you really need to get down to about 0 0.2 in order for terahertz to really work nicely. And this is where Antarctica comes in. Because Antarctica is very cold, and this means that all the water basically freezes out of snow, falls to the ground, and the atmosphere is then clear. But in searching for the best sites, we look at a map like this, which this is just the southern hemisphere. It shows precipitable water vapour. And if I, uh, presumably I can just uh, run this. So this is a whole year. This is 2013. And what immediately uh, you see from this is that Chile, this area here, is very good. It's always got low precipitable water vapour. New Zealand is uh, not so good. So that's why you put telescopes in Chile rather than New Zealand in general. But Notice down the bottom, this is Antarctica. It's always blue. And its water vapour is extremely low. So this is the same data, but now looking from above the South Pole. And I've increased the, uh, the stretch here by a factor of 20. You can see Chile is just appearing. And, but most of the time, Chile is worse than the worst conditions in Antarctica. So if we go in the centre of Antarctica here, we will get fantastically low precipitable water vapour, and we can observe the terahertz from the ground without having to go into space. Plus, it's a lot of fun to go to Antarctica, as I'll show you shortly. So this is where we're going. We're actually going to go to a place called Ridge A, which is very close to Dome A. And just notice how high it is. Three, it's at 4,000 metres. So you're sitting on around about three kilometres of ice when you're at uh, Ridge A. Now, to get there, we start in Sydney, and we fly to Christchurch, which takes a couple, two and a half hours, then another three and a half hours to get to McMurdo, another two and a half hours to the South Pole, and a few more hours to Ridge A. So you can be at Ridge A within a day if you get your flight connections correct. And so we start in uh, Lever, Sydney. We go to Christchurch, where we get kitted out with our Antarctic gear. We get a, a safety briefing, which is a little bit more complicated than your usual safety briefing for an airline. They tell you how you, uh, how you need to undo the bolts and the ceiling of the aircraft and climb out through the hatch. Uh, and uh, when the, you know, the oxygen masks don't just drop from the top, they're actually bags that you've got to put over your head and then you break a canister of chemicals for the oxygen. And anyway, it's, it's, it's very complicated and you just hope that nothing goes wrong. Then you line up and uh, 
In this case, we're lucky enough to have a C-17 Globemaster, which is a very nice, fast aircraft. This is what it looks like inside. There I am with uh, three of my colleagues from the University of New South Wales. Uh, these two engineers, uh, Luke Bycroft, Cam uh, Campbell McLaren, both uh, from New Zealand. In fact, Luke is uh, from Auckland. And so it's a very uh, nice flight. And halfway there, you're getting very excited. You're starting to see icebergs out the window. And three and a half hours after leaving Christchurch, you land on the ice runway at McMurdo. So this is over the ice, uh, Ross ice shelf. So it's a, a fantastic experience. And when you get to McMurdo, which is a, an hour's drive away from where you land, this is the McMurdo with about 1,000 people over summer. There's Scott's Hut, where Scott uh, spent some time in around about 1911, I think it was. Sorry? 1902. Sorry, thank you. Uh, and this is Observation Hill. And if you climb up there, you get the nice view. And there I am with Luke on the top of Observation Hill. Get a fantastic view of Antarctica. And this, this is literally only you know, 10 hours after leaving Christchurch. It's just absolutely amazing. And I swung the camera around by 180 degrees, and there's Mount Erebus, which is an active volcano. And you can see a little bit of a puff of smoke coming from the top. And get out your telephoto lens, and then you can see a seal. Get a bit closer, but not too close. And there's strict protocols about how close you can get to these, to any wildlife like this. You're not allowed to get close enough that they notice you. So you, you've got to stay far enough away. So it's a very long telephoto lens. And if you do get too close, this is what happens to you. <laughs> Hopefully, oh, it's very sad, isn't it? Really? Sorry. <laughs> OK, so. From McMurdo, since we're going to the High Plateau, we're going somewhere where there's, there's very little support. We have to be able to uh, survive in the snow. So we do something called Happy Camper School, where they take us out with a tent and a shovel. We uh, erect our tents, we cook a meal, and we stay overnight. We dig, dig into the snow and make these shelters for ourselves. This is much quicker than building an igloo. And you also practice finding the, finding the dunny uh, in a whiteout. So you can do that by putting a, a plastic bucket over your head and, and you can wander around until you eventually find it. And there's a rope to bring you back if you get lost. Okay, but eventually it's time to head off to the South Pole and you do that in a Hercules aircraft. And these are ski equipped. You, you, probably, you can barely see it, but uh, the next, so next slide shows the skis. And you can either have wheels or skis depending on some hydraulic uh, things here. There are also some JATO, this is Jet Assisted Takeoff, uh, solid rocket boosters which you can strap on the side, uh, which are occasionally used, although early on one of these came loose and went right through the propeller. Uh, so they're, they're pretty reluctant to use them. And a mere two and a half hours later, you're at the South Pole. This is actual 90 degrees south. And, no, nope. sorry, <laughs> not time yet. I've got a video which I'm going to show in a second. And you find this. This is amazing. This is the US Munson Scott Station, which is just absolutely incredible. State-of-the-art laboratories inside, fantastic support. This is about a kilometre away from the BICEP2 experiment that John was referring to. And there's the actual geographic South Pole. You see the, uh, there's the building in the background. This is minus 90 degrees south. And to prove it, I got out my GPS. <laughs> and you can see 90.000.000. .000 .000. And the le longitude was changing like crazy, you know, just moved by a, like a few centimetres and changes by 10 degrees longitude. And then you look in the other direction, this is what you see. This is the high plateau of Antarctica. It's absolutely amazing. It's dead flat. It's three kilometres thickness of ice. Uh, it's, it's just superb for astronomy. The conditions are incredibly clear. Uh, you, just, you just can't believe it. And you don't have uh, violent storms like you do around the edge of the continent. It's, it's calm most of the time, very low wind speeds. You can walk around in a t-shirt, would you believe, at minus 30 degrees C, just because, well, not for very long, maybe for a minute. <laughs> but walking between buildings, you can do that. Just because the wind is so low and you get a bit of sunshine on you, it's fine. It's an amazing location. And inside the lab, you have state-of-the-art facilities. And here's my, uh, here are my colleagues. This is Craig Kalesa, who built the instrument working on the electronics for the telescope, which I'll show you a little bit later on. And here are Luke and Campbell, our New Zealand engineers, who uh, helped us design and build the, the power system which will provide power for our telescope. So I probably haven't explained that Ridge A, where we're going, is completely remote. There's no one there. 
we have to make our observations during winter time uh, by remote control. So we have to build a complete power system which is able to run for a year without any human intervention. And we also have uh, satellite communications to control. So what this box contains are two diesel engines and 800 litres of jet fuel, and this provides our electricity to run the telescope which you saw in the previous slide. And we have to take the whole thing to Ridge A, which is 950 kilometres from the South Pole, using a twin otter. And we designed it so it just fits inside. And there it is, there's the pilot, a Canadian pilot, uh, who just managed to manhandle this 500 kilogram weight, and these guys can somehow push it around, but it's a very close thing. And so when the pilots uh, first flew to, the first time they went to Ridge A, they flew from South Pole just with the pilot and the co-pilot, and some safety gear and some fuel. And they landed at Ridge A and then they discovered that they couldn't take off again. It was the first time anyone had been there. The reason they couldn't take it off was because the, the ground was so uneven, they couldn't get enough speed up without the aircraft wobbling. And I'll just show you what that looks like here. This is a takeoff from Ridge A with a twin otter aircraft. Okay, a big sigh of relief when they get off the ground. Now, this is after they'd spent four hours with a shovel actually making, making a runway. And they were doing this uh, at four kilometre altitude where actually breathing is in fact quite difficult. If we can move back to the other one. Uh, so they're, they're gasping for breath. They're, they're, stroke, they're really concerned about getting off. They're using a shovel to make enough of a runway to, to take off. It's, it's pretty scary. So to get around that problem, uh, Fortunately, we had Sean Tell, who was our skiway groomer, and she went in with a special device which she pulled behind a skidoo, and she ran up and down for about 12 hours and made a runway for us, and that's how we managed to get everything in quite safely after that. So you can see her shovel. She's a very effective skiway groomer. Okay, so here we are, uh, just about to land at the Ridge A runway. This is, this is what Sean Tell did. She made a, a runway for us on the snow. Here's our experiment. There's the diesel engines. That's the uh, telescope and that's our computer systems. And here we are unpacking a whole bunch of equipment from the Twin Otter aircraft. And here we are, the observatory is now established. We spent about a week there on site to, to build everything and we sleep in tents. The, the warmest it gets is about minus 35 or so, John. It gets down to about minus 45. It's pretty, and there's nowhere to go if you want to warm up. So it's a pretty tough environment. And at four kilometre altitude, it's, the breathing is difficult, sleeping is difficult, so it's not a picnic. And help is a long way away. If something goes wrong, you can't necessarily guarantee an aircraft will come in quickly. So here we are. Now, this is our telescope, and don't laugh. It's inside this little post box thing here. It looks fairly uh, small, but it's actually the world's most powerful terahertz telescope. And there's Craig. And this is what it looks like if you take the cover off, and there's a bunch of mirrors which re eventually reflect light inside this device here, which is a vacuum chamber containing a single uh, diode detector, which is able to detect terahertz radiation. And we have to cool it down to about 50 degrees Kelvin, so that's about minus 220 degrees Celsius, in order for it to work. And that's quite a challenge because it needs quite a lot of power. And this is what we look like after we come out. We've spent a week at Dome A, we've been packing up the camp, and this is Nick Bingham, one of our engineers, with just a few minutes after getting onto the aircraft to go back to, Dome, uh, to South Pole, and he's absolutely uh, stuffed. <laughs> and looking forward to some, uh, getting to a nice warm location after a week. So let me just show you some data from Ridge A. This, this, these are some all-sky images taken with an optical camera showing the Milky Way and some aurora photographs taken mid-winter. First time anyone has been able to get photographs in mid-winter because uh, there's no humans there, obviously. And we have a web camera there, so when the sun's up, you can easily see the instrument, make sure it's working properly, and, and uh, a flag, which gives you an indication of how much wind there is. And this is an example of some of our data. It doesn't look quite as impressive as some of those pictures I showed you at the beginning, but this is 
about one square degree of uh, sky as observed by our telescope, where the, this is the, uh, indicates the amount of uh, carbon atoms that we're seeing along the line of sight. And the full moon is roughly sort of that sort of size. Now, one of the really great things about our telescope is not only does it get two-dimensional images like this, but every point here, we can measure its velocity. And what that means is that if this is our Milky Way is observed from above, the sun's here, we're looking through the Milky Way along this line of sight, the whole galaxy is rotating. And what that means is that different spiral arms appear at different velocities relative to the Earth. And so you can, by measuring the velocity, you can, can, you can figure out how far away some, something is. And so you can turn that previous slide into this. This is now rotated. We're, we're actually looking basically at the distance away from us. And you can see three spiral arms. And this is sort of the ultimate uh, result of, of uh, putting our data together, this little movie here, which are three-dimensional cubes passing through the galaxy showing molecular clouds in the emission of different species. For example, carbon monoxide, uh, hydrogen, and uh, neutral carbon. And astronomers can now use, this is basically probing into those dark clouds that I showed you at the beginning of the talk, and we can use this sort of data to actually work out what's going on and how stars are formed. It's really only early days yet, but the data is now publicly available and we're getting a lot of interest from other astronomers. So just to finish off, um, one of the amazing things is that Antarctica conditions are so fantastic that a simple little telescope like this is actually, uh, in many, many cases, more capable than this, uh, which is the ARMA telescope in Chile, which is a, like a billion dollar facility for terahertz astronomy. You can't do what we're doing anywhere else except space or a balloon. And with that, I'll leave you and pass you along to Lee Farm One.